All right, if you've got your Bibles, uh, turn with me. We're going to 1 Corinthians this morning. Goodness and mercy are going to follow me. And we're in chapter 7. Uh, we're going to be looking at 16 verses. And we're going to be talking about there's grace for that. Will you just declare that out loud? Just say, there's grace for that. Whenever you're in a difficult place, just recognize there is grace for that. How many of you need some, some grace this morning? Yeah, yeah, I, I know I need, I, need, I need grace this morning. Now, we've been studying this book of, of Corinthians, and um, uh, we've been seeing that the believers are in, 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 in an interesting spot. There's a lot of uh, compromise within the church. In fact, there's so much compromise. I don't know if you were here last week, but Paul had to, like, he had to confront some stuff last week. For example, there was stuff ha- happening in the church where, like, where believers were excusing sexual sin with, like, with, like prostitutes, okay? Like, now, how many of you know that, like, when prostitution becomes kind of commonplace in the church— like, that's just not a good deal at all, right? So Paul is just like, he's having to break down the breakdowns. He's having to be like, hey, don't you realize that what marriage is? Don't you know what this, what this gift of our sexuality is? Don't you realize that when you do this, um, that you're becoming one flesh with a, with a prostitute? And our take home last week was that, um, uh, you know, not obviously like, don't engage prostitution, all right? Like, hopefully that's, hopefully that's already pretty straightforward. But the invitation last week was that we should not give our souls to idols. That the, 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 the sin of sexual immorality is a sin of idolatry when we're giving of our mind, our will, and our emotions to any person or anything that is not God. At the end of the, the service last week, we even broke soul ties and soul attachments and that is with uh, people or things, even maybe even churches that we actually gave our soul to and we established maybe a good thing uh, or a good person and we replaced Jesus with that person. So we actually broke soul ties and tattoos. And then we took back the parts of our soul that don't belong to them. We took them back to us and we also released parts of their soul. Uh, so, that was, so that was actually, that was good. Now, when it comes to what we're looking at this week, um, Paul's going to continue to talk about uh, sexuality. And Daniel, if you can just put up that, 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 that slide there, that would be, that, that'd be awesome. Uh, my phone's not actually working, so I'll just kind of work with you, and, um, and this will be good. Oh, look, it, there, there just came up. Hallelujah. There's grace for that. Just go, there's grace for that. Awesome. All right, so this week, Paul's going to keep talking about sexuality, and he's actually going to be talking about Um, not the people that are engaging with prostitution, not the people that are being uh, super loose with their morals, um, but he's actually actually going to talk about um, uh, believers that are Christians and they are so religious that it's not that they're not sleeping, they're not sleeping around with anyone. In fact, they're not even sleeping with their own spouses. So it's not that they're super loose with their morals. It's like they're like sexually celibate, but they're married, Okay. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we'll do a big altar call, and everyone that's in this, 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 this place, we're going to have you run to the front. It's going to be super embarrassing, but it'll be good, and um, we'll, get you, we'll get you free so that you can have a little more fun in life. All right, here we go, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is, this is the quote, okay? So last week, we were talking about these different quotes that Christians are using in the church, okay? So here's a quote. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So that's what Christians are, that's what Christians are saying, okay? Now Paul's going to respond. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Verse 3. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his, uh, over his own body, but his wife does, right? Verse 5, so do not deprive one another, okay, uh, except perhaps for an agreed upon a limited amount of time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again, um, uh, 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 which, which means like come together again, like fireworks, like 
we're together again, baby, all right. You know, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. So this is what Paul is saying. Last week he's like, you guys are being reckless. There's no revelation of your sexuality as worship unto the Lord. And then this week that Paul is saying, wow, you're, you're, you're using your religion as a convenience to not give yourself to your spouse. And so this is what Paul is saying, that within the context of, of, of covenant marriage, one man, one woman, um, that, uh, that there should be regular uh, sexual activity, that this is good. And don't think that by not engaging in intimacy with your spouse, that somehow that makes you more holy. He's like, the only time that you, shouldn't, that you should be withholding yourself is that if, if, for, if for some reason you're going to go on a sexual fast, you know, um, as, you know which um, let me just recommend maybe like a water fast first. Or maybe even a Daniel fast. You can do a juice fast. You can do all, maybe just fast social media. But like, if you're really, really, really extreme and you're like, we're not going to, you know, and, and there's an agreement there, all right, knock yourself out. Like, give, give it a shot. To, you know, let me know what happened. Like, God bless you. There's grace for that. But Paul is like, but that shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the norm. Okay, and so right off the bat, this is what Paul is saying. Hey, if you're married, but there's not intimacy in your marriage, there's not sexuality, and you're withholding yourself for whatever reason, maybe there's hurt, maybe there's trauma, or maybe there's even control. You know, sometimes even in Christian marriages, we use um, sex as a, as a way of controlling our spouse. You know, uh, sometimes, in, um, uh, uh, sometimes people even, no one here, probably people watching online, but sometimes people sometimes even use sex as like, as like, a, um, as like a, a, a doggy treat. You know, if you, you know, sit. All right, good. Here, here's your doggy treat. You know, it's almost like, if, you, know, it, you know, honey, I noticed you didn't do the dishes tonight. Right. <laughs> you know, bad husband, maybe tomorrow night. So anyways, like it's, um, <laughs> like I said, no one here. But, um, it's the online. I'm just kidding. God bless you. Um, but like, we're not supposed to do that. Like, that's not how we're. That's not how we're supposed to be um, as as believers. That as believers, that we get this revelation that my body isn't isn't my own. It, it belongs uh, to my honey. It belongs to my bride, and likewise. And so that we shouldn't be um, uh, 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 abusing each other in the same way that you would never abuse your own body, and you should not be manipulating each other in the same way that you would never manipulate yourself. That we are to love each other and we are to cherish each other. And that we are not to, we are not to, we are not to uh, have some sort of um, pagan idea that abstinence within marriage is going to bring us into some sort of crazy higher level mysticism. Because that's what was, that was what was happening there. It was like you just, you know, cut that out of your life and the Lord is going, and, and, and all of a sudden that, that mystic realm uh, would open up because I'll tell you this: like, if 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 the only way for me to get to the third heaven would be to cut Andrea off and be like, you know, or like we're gonna have to be married but not married and whatever else, man, the third heaven can wait till I die. I'd rather have heaven on earth with my babes here and now, than this realm and this time space. Yeah, because that's the way. I don't, don't want to be crude or anything, but that's the, the Lord He created us. This is worship. Sex is His idea. Don't let the world. Mess it up. Don't let the world pervert it or destroy it. I mean, it's already tried so incredibly hard, even to the degree where, you know, you, you mention anything political in the church, or you mention anything sexual in the church, be like, you shouldn't talk about that. The only problem is the Bible does. Trust me, there's like a billion other things I'd rather be talking about today. Like a billion other things. Like I was like sitting down to like prepare for this week, and I'm like, oh, are you serious? Just think about last week, you know, s- stop sleeping with prostitutes. Like that was a... That's a tricky one. So if you can do what I did last week, you are seriously good. And I'm not bragging, but this ain't my first rodeo. All right. So this, this is what Paul says, right? Like, avoid religious extremes with this stuff, right? Like, celebrate this, this incredible act of worship that the, Lord has, uh, that the Lord has given to you. And then he says, verse 6, Now as a concession, not as, not as a command, I wish that all were as myself, like I am. Right? Paul's like, hey, like, I'm not boasting in this. And this is, Paul's like, listen now, this is not a commandment. 
But I wish all of you were more like me. And I'll just say that right now. Like, I'm not boasting in who I am, you know, but I wish that all of you guys were more like Darren. Let's pray, and I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So you guys are like, this guy's weird. Um, but <laughs> this is what Paul says. It'll make sense in a second. He goes, but, each, but everybody has, like, their own gift, right? One, uh, one of the one, like the other. So what Paul's saying. Everybody has, like, their, their, own, their own grace on their life. And you guys, we've got to be a lot better at, like, recognizing the graces on each other's lives. Because, like, you've got, like, a grace on your life that, that I probably don't have. So we've got to, like, start having a lot more discernment to recognize when there's a grace on somebody's life. And to recognize that when we honor the grace on somebody's life, we can actually receive it. Like, and so when we're, when we're able to, like, honor, like, Paul's like, hey, I have a grace in this. A grace in what? He goes, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say it's good for them to remain single, just like me. So what Paul's saying. He's like, hey, I'm single. I wish that all of you guys could be like me. I have a grace for singleness. He goes, but uh, I recognize that um, some of you aren't really all that great in the whole, like, self-control department. And so for you, you should probably get married. He goes, it's better to get married Right then to burn with, uh, with passion. Um, and if you don't know what that means, just volunteer at a middle school. It says here uh, that, uh, that Paul's got this incredible, how many of you, how many of you, I don't know if you were in a say, like if you're a Christian when you were a teenager, but you went to like a youth group and you heard a youth pastor teach that singleness is a gift. Like wave, wave at me. Oh, look it. I thought there'd be way more. Like I just remember that all the time. Like, singleness is a gift. And then they tried to prove it to you. You can watch TV whenever you want. You can go to bed as late as you want. Right? Like, you can spend your money on anything you want. Like, it's such a gift. Like, when you get married, you have to go to bed when your spouse goes to bed. If you spend money, they're going to know about it. Right? Like, singleness is a gift. Right? And I, 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 I remember always just being like, I don't think it is. Like, I think this singleness sucks. I want to be married. Like, yeah, but you're 12, so you just wait. Right? You know, I'm ready. I'm ready to be married. Like, no, your voice is still cracking. You need to wait. Your brain isn't even developed. You're still, like, running into walls. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't think what Paul is saying here is that singleness is a gift. I think what he's saying is I have the gift or the grace to be single. Listen, if you're in a marriage and there's not intimacy and there's not connection there, and may maybe there's a lot of reasons. Trauma can be there. Um, you know, uh, a lot, lot, lot of different reasons. Maybe physically, just something happened, you're not physically able to connect in that way. But look, there's grace. There's grace for that. And if you're, um, if you're single and you're, you're waiting to get married, um, or maybe you're single and there's a grace and you're just like, look, I know that I'm not, I'm not going to get married. There's a grace for, for singleness and I'm just going to go after God. And, and um, you know, and whatever, whatever that looks like, for, for whatever reason, there's, there's grace for that. Um, you're single now, but it's your desire to get married. There's grace. Now, when, when you, Darren, you keep talking about grace. Does grace mean that when I sin, I'm forgiven? Because that's what we always think. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound is saved. A wretch, ugly, pathetic worm like me. <laughs> you know, especially when you're a teenager, you're like, I identify with all of that, right? Like, uh, <laughs> good times. Man, we need to pray a lot more for uh, Pastor Corey and all of our youth leaders because being a teenager is just tricky right but uh, you know grace is not just forgiveness to sin like when you sin no no grace is divine enablement to not have to sin grace is supernatural power to be able to accomplish what God has called you to accomplish what does that mean that that where, wherever you're at in your marital status there is divine supernatural enablement to help you in this season praise God yeah, why is that important? Because if you don't engage with grace, you might engage with the spirit of desperation. And if you're desperate, um, let me just say that like desperation doesn't do wonders when you're trying to attract the opposite sex. It, it doesn't. Desperation tends to lead us into devastation. So we need to operate according to grace. Why? Because if you're operating and you're partnering with frustration, you're just like, ah, why, don't, why isn't anyone into me? Ah, why doesn't anyone find me attractive? Ah, it's because you're losing hair. You need grace. Take a deep breath. Receive the grace. Like, like God, what you have, it's more than enough for me. Like, I, like in this grace, in this place, there's supernatural provision from heaven to meet my every need so that I don't have to find 
find a dude to complete me. Because I'll just tell you this. I don't care what dude you find. He ain't going to be able to complete you. I know a lot of dudes. Like, you complete me. No, <laughs> he won't. And she will not complete you. When you find the one, when you find the unicorn, and you start dating, and like, you know, th this is what I know. Everything just gets a lot more complicated like if you think that like that that finding the one is going to bring shalom and peace it's going to calm your storm honey you're wrong <laughs> use this opportunity and find that grace to find a sense of shalom in this place where if you even if you said even if nothing ever changed change in my in my in my single status God you are more than enough it is my desire to be married it is my desire to be with a with a companion but I will not compromise my identity I will not compromise my values I will not perform in order to get somebody to love me I know you love me and that is more than enough and the, and they're going to have to have your approval before they have my approval For all the marrieds, there's grace. For all the singles, there's grace. Verse 10, it says, And to the married, I give this charge. Not I, but the Lord. The wife should not separate her, uh, herself from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. This is what he's saying. He's saying, hey, he's saying in the church in Corinth, divorce has become very, very common. Okay? And this is very true even in the church in America that divorce has become very, very common. So he's speaking to the believers. He's like, hey, listen, um, there may be divorce that takes place from time to time within the community, but it should be the exception. It should not be, it should not be the norm. He says, hey, if, if you're going to get married, don't, don't separate. Um, I, I, Andrew and I, we, we went through uh, six months of uh, premarital counseling, um, and for us, that looked more like World War III than it did like premarital counseling. Um, for us, that was, just, that was just very, very difficult as we had to just open up all of our junk drawers and open up all of our stuff and just get very, very real about whatever sinfulness and whatever kind of stuff hadn't really been dealt with. There was a lot of confession. There was a lot of uh, tears. There was a lot of misunderstanding. There was a lot of just trying to figure out um, our identities and, and really if our identities were uh, co uh, compatible. And through this process, this, this incredible couple that, that counseled us, um, they made us a promise, and their promise was, um, it is our commitment. We are going to try to break you up. And they said, because um, if, 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 if we're capable of breaking you up, just think of what the enemy is capable of doing. We don't know who you are. We don't know your, your, your buttons. We don't know your pressure points. And so if we're able to do it, just think of what the enemy is, is able to do. And so um, there, we're going we're gonna to give you very difficult questions knowing that the answers might bring division. And we're doing that on purpose because we would rather you have division while you're courting than division when you're married. And there's a young couple here, and we're going to be meeting this week to talk about the potential marriage. And now they're thinking about maybe rescheduling or canceling. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. They'll be like, you know what? <laughs> just like, I'm having a lot of fun. But that's, that's actually true. Um, we went through this. We went through this very difficult process. And one of the things that they said is they brought us to this point is if you are going to go before your friends and your family before the Lord, and you're going to make this covenant, then no matter how real it gets in sickness and in health and poverty and wealth, I'm not going anywhere. No matter what comes out of you, no matter who you turn out to be, like, I'm in this with you, and you're in this with me. And so we need to come to an agreement right off the bat. And this is for Andrew and I. This might not be your story, but listen, we need to covenant together that we're just not going to ever have the D word in our vocabulary. The D word meaning, like, divorce. Like, that cannot really be option, you know, option C. Or like, like, man, this is really rough. Well, I've always got the divorce card that I can, that I can play, you know. And for us, that was really helpful because that was just like, well, we're just going to cut that word out of our vocabulary. And, and this I can tell you, Andrew and I, um, we've, we've had some real, just like anyone that's been married for longer than 24 hours, we've had some real 
conversations, right? Like, you, you know how it is when there's just total misunderstanding and there's just this total place of, like, just, just dis, of disconnection. And um, uh, there was two things. I didn't share this with the first service, but I feel like I'm supposed to share it now. We decided that we would not let the sun go down on our unresolved wrath. And that meant that that there would have to be a, mut- a, a fight one way or the other to have just enough reconciliation before we could actually go to sleep. Because don't get me wrong, oftentimes when the sun goes down, that's when it gets real. Oh, yeah. What did you just say? I can't believe you would say that. Right? Like, who, who are you? Who did I marry? Okay, we're not talking about the sun going down. We're actually talking about that you would not try to put your soul to sleep when your soul is still tied up with all that angst because sometimes what happens is we go to sleep and then we wake up and then we never go back to resolve the conflict and yet our soul is still connected with that angst and now there's something called distrust and it's got a root within our heart because we didn't do the work the painful work to deal with that when it was when it was raw and we think we can move on but that there's a crack now in the foundation of our relationship I met with a couple once, and they were, they were in, a, in, a, in an argument, in a big fight, and, uh, and she yelled at him, and she said, well, just divorce me then. Um, and I said, well, okay, stop. I, I, I did a James Gall on her. I was like, no, Pauls. Pauls. When you said that, did you mean it? And she goes, no, of course not. So then he responded. She said, just divorce me then. And then he responded. How did he respond? He said, fine. Um, I said to him, when you said fine, did you mean that? Did you want to agree to divorce? And he goes, of course not. So here she just basically said something that she didn't mean. And here he just agreed to something that he didn't want. Why? Because he had a big powerful word in your vocabulary that you could use manipulatively to get to an outcome and you can bet the second he said fine there was probably something in her heart that broke how could you agree how could you agree to this and you can bet the moment she said that something in his heart broke how could you ever say that this is where Paul says hey to the married I'm giving you this charge Divorce shouldn't really be something that's in our vocabulary, and we should go through the work in our singleness to make sure that there's just enough honesty and enough confession and and, and enough uh, shared values where we both agree that this is something that's going to be really, really tough. It's going to be something that's really, really difficult, but that we're going to we're going to we're going to fight to make sure that when we fight, we're not fighting against each other, but we're fighting for each other. Now, in the church here, you've got people that are very liberal. And what I mean by that is, I'm not speaking of uh, politically. I'm speaking of, if you look at Webster's Dictionary for liberal, it means lacking moral restraint. And you see people that are very haphazardly going through divorce. That happens in the church even today. Um, When you have people that haven't gone through the work, they haven't been properly prepared, they kind of flippantly, if you flippantly get married, you can flippantly fall out of marriage. Okay, and that's why I, I take this so, so, so seriously um, when it comes to marriage. People say, hey, it's legal in uh, Washington State for gays and lesbians to, to get married. Well, I don't really care what the law says because I believe that the state of Washington doesn't give two poops about your marriage. All they want is income. All they want is your, is your money. You see, in order to get a driver's license, you actually have to take a test. You actually have to prove that you have enough competence to be on the road. You have to take a, a, a drive. You have to take a written test. And then you pay some money and you get a license. Uh, to get a marriage license, they don't require anything but some money. And then you've got to prove you're of, of age. Yeah. Because the state does not care about your marriage. I, I wish more than one person was saying amen right now. In the church, we should care more about marriage. That marriage, I don't care what religion you're, I don't care if you go back 2,000, I don't care what tribe you come from. Marriage has always been a religious institution. Even if you're part of some religion where, 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 a, where like a, a, a monkey with painted face, that, like Simba, if you're part of some, you know, like, 
you get the point. If you're part of some shaman, they, you go to the shaman for your marriage. You go to the priest for, for, your, for your marriage. That marriage is a spiritual, sacred institution. It belongs to the church. The government has no right defining what marriage is. Period. So I don't care what the government defines as marriage. I care what the Bible defines as marriage. And if you're part of the Wonka Wonka tribe, then you'll have your own spiritual book that defines marriage. Or if you're an atheist and there is no God, we're just plasm that evolved and turned into apes, created the internet, and I'll just live, drink, and be merry. One day I'll die. Then cool. You define it however you want to. But if you're going to be religious, you have to recognize that marriage is a religious institution. And therefore, we have to care deeply about marriage, which is why when somebody is about to go through a divorce and there's deep pain in a family, we should take that just as serious as if there was a car swerving across the road, swerving into each other's life. So, somebody said, well, you need to stay out of my business. You, this isn't your life. This isn't my whatever. This is, you are a sister in the body of Christ. You are a brother in the body of Christ. You are worth fighting for. Your family is worth fighting for. Your marriage is worth fighting for. This you Union is worth fighting for, so let's fight. Let's bleed. Let's let's get sweaty. Let's work this out. You don't have to like this. Isn't about your happiness. This is about your holiness. When is somebody going to give a hoot about marriage? When is somebody going to fight for marriage? When are you going to fight for your own marriage? When are you going to fight for someone else's marriage? Listen, if you don't care about your marriage, you're not going to care about somebody else's marriage. Self-help, it's the biggest cult in America. The most books that sell in anything is self-help. We all want to figure out how to get six-pack abs and be billionaires, and it's all, it's all selfishness, which is, the, which is the very antithesis of love, that the opposite and the enemy of love is selfishness. And it's where I want to invest into me. I need a me day. I need, I need, uh, I need Monday without my wife. I need a day without, and, and we create these selfishness zones because we think that that's what's going to make us uh, 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 healthy and, 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 and happy. But what, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean, this is not very popular, but what does it mean to actually hang on a cross and intercede for the very people that are killing you? And Paul would say, husbands, you want to know what it looks like to be married? It looks like like Jesus on a cross, naked, shamed, um, stripped of everything, being disgraced. You want to know what it's like to be a Christian husband? Look at Jesus as he intercedes for the very people. My wife, my wife, this is has your wife stripped you naked and tried to kill you? No, shut up. I'm just kidding. I don't mean that. I love you. I do. I love you. And if, man, and if she did strip you naked, like, call the cops, right? Well, strip you naked is fine. But if she tries to kill you, like, like, some guys be like, yeah! Like, what are you doing? You're stripping me naked. Okay. Right? But, like, but if she crosses the line and she starts trying to put nails through your arms, right? Then you, then you call the cops. Then you call the cops. I'm glad we, sometimes you got to clarify stuff. It looks like selflessness. It means that I am, I am giving you not just my body, I'm giving you my mind, my will, my emotions. That means that I'm taking time not just for me, I'm taking time without you to think about you and how I'm going to serve you and how I'm going to love you. It means that even when you're not with your spouse, you're being creative of how, and this is why pornography is, is so devastating to a marriage because when you've got pornography, and this is not just for males anymore, I mean, uh, th this thing is just rampant and it's just, it's just, it's crazy, the, the attack that's on women right now within our, within our culture. It comes to get you to selfishly and secretly prepare a place where you give your soul to an idol at the expense of draining your real relationship and intimacy of the creative life and energy and flourishing that it demands. Because when you're with pornography, you're with a romance novel, or you're, or you're watching some, some, something on Netflix and you're just like, Ooh, you, know, you, just, you know, just doing, <laughs> doing, doing your thing you're not thinking about your spouse you're not you might be comparing them to your spouse which is absolutely uh, devastating but it, what if there was that place where we could say uh, that I will have nothing e I will have nothing in common with evil that darkness will not have any sort of dominion over any sort of my heart and that I am giving my my the full bandwidth of my creativity my life my love to devote and to invest in 
into my spouse, into my, into my helpmate. And I'm going to make sure that Andrea, that there's life, that there's love, and that, that I am giving her my best, and that I'm not being drained of my best by something that is deceiving me, something that comes to, to rob from me, something that comes to, and it's not just for Andrea, but it's for my children. There's a battle for our bandwidth. We all agree about that. There's a battle for our bandwidth. And the enemy comes to entangle with our soul as a method of escape and entertainment so that we give ourselves to these things so that we're no longer available. Some of us, it's not that we're too busy. It's that we've, we've given too much of our bandwidth to idols. I'm too busy to do anything in the kingdom. No, no, you've, you've offered your, the best of you to an idol. And it's time to say no more idolatry. Yeah. So some, some within the church were being haphazard, going through divorce, just nonchalant. But others in the church, they were becoming Christians, and then they were cutting off their spouse because their spouse wasn't converting. So you've got all this. It's a tricky time. All these people are getting, are getting saved every week and added to the church. But you've got marriages, and one person meets Jesus. The other person says, yeah, Jesus isn't for me. This religion thing isn't for me. So now you've got believers going through divorce. Why? Because the Christian is saying, I can't be unequally yoked, so now I'm cutting you off because you're the unbeliever, okay? So two different things, haphazard divorce, and then the other is a, a spiritual excuse to get divorced. And this happens all the time, even, even to this day. I'm a new creation. You're still an old creation. I can't be in covenant with you, you old creation, you, you know? That's not very nice. Old what? <laughs> you know? Verse 12. To the rest, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. So this is what it says. Um, to all the dudes that are meeting Jesus and your wife isn't there yet, as long as she's cool with it, you stay married to her. Yeah? And look at verse 13. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. Verse 14, for the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife. Woo -woo! Did you read that? Yeah. I would never say that. Paul did, so don't get mad at me. Like, how does that work? Not a clue. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But all right, let's just keep reading. <laughs> and the unbelieving wife, check it out. The unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. The husband is affected by the wife's righteousness. The wife is affected by the righteousness of her husband. The children are affected by the righteousness of the parents. Everybody gets affected by our righteousness. Everybody gets affected by unrighteousness, but Paul says righteousness is more powerful than unrighteousness. So if you've got a righteous spouse and an unbelieving spouse, the righteousness of the spouse dwarfs the unrighteousness of the other spouse. R yeah. Light is more powerful than darkness. Verse 15. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. So if the unbeliever is like, look, I just can't do this. You're crazy. You're a Christian. And Paul says, all right. Okay. Don't force them to stay in the relationship. Um, let them go. In such cases, the brother or sister will not be enslaved. Look at this, guys. God has called you to peace. Just declare over yourself right now. God has called me to peace. Mm. Verse 16. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife. You know what this is? This is like a believer in a household, and because they believe, they've opened the door to heaven. Have you heard of open doors? Careful with that sin. Why? That sin could open up the door to the demonic. But how do you know that you can do a righteous act, and you can open the door to heaven? All of a sudden, righteousness comes flooding into your home. All of a sudden, peace comes flooding into your home. All of a sudden, 
joy comes flooding into your home. And you've got the king of the castle or the queen of the castle, and they don't even realize it, but their kingdom is changing. Bless you. Just declare it. There's grace for that. There is grace for the humble, for the honest, and for the repentant. In 2021, we're going to do things differently in 2020. Amen? I know I'm speaking that for myself. The very first thing that I'd like for us to really covenant to is that in 2021, we're going to be honest. Just declare with me, be honest. What does that mean? It means being free of all deceit, all lies, all untruthfulness. Why? Because you don't have to lie to be accepted in the kingdom. Why? You're infinitely loved and accepted because of what Jesus has done. You're not accepted because you look like you're holy. You are holy because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, you can be honest knowing that your imperfection does not disqualify you. If you know that your imperfection, if you know that your sinfulness does not disqualify you, then you are absolutely, radically free to be honest knowing that your honesty does not redefine you. Just declare that. My honesty... How do we want to do it? My honesty does not disqualify me. Just declare it. My honesty does not disqualify me. Why? Because I am loved. You believe that? No deceit, no untruthfulness, no lies. I can be honest. When you're honest, there's grace. Supernatural empowerment, connection, to do what God's called you to do. The second thing is be humble. Declare, be humble. be humble. What does that mean? It means free of all pride and arrogance. How do you know when you're proud? That's a good question. When somebody comes to show you something in your life, when somebody comes to maybe rebuke you, and then you flip it on them, showing them their issues and their problems, that can be an indicator that there's not humility, there's pride. Why? Because the feedback, the correction, was perceived as rejection. Because we've been doing everything possible to perform in such a way that we're accepted so that when somebody criticizes our performance, it's not just, it's, it's not just a, a prick, it kind of handicaps us to the core of who we are. I had a pastor you know, once said to me, good thing my identity is not wrapped up in ministry. And I said, ha! I laughed at him. I said, of course your, your identity is wrapped up in ministry. All of us ministers, we're having to process through that. Yeah, which is why when, and it's not as bad as it used to be, but it used to be back in the old days, you know, Nobody ever tells you that you preached a bad sermon, but when they do, you preached a bad sermon. You know what I'm saying? Now, I'm just going to tell you what. I have preached some of the worst sermons. I have. I can tell you stories, and I can tell you what. It's never fun. It's never fun to miss the mark. But I can tell you this, that whenever, there's times when people are like, oh, that was the best ever, but I know the truth. It was lame. Like that was, that was. And, and, and guess who's waiting for you the moment you get off the stage? Not people wanting prayer. Demons. <laughs> that was the worst ever. You're so off. What's wrong with you? Are you even saved? <laughs> My heart goes out to like, you know, and ask anybody that's ever preached a message like, like, what is that? That's, that's our, it's like, I tried so hard. I studied, I prayed, I sought the Lord. I wanted to do right by God. I wanted to do right by people. And for whatever reason, it just didn't work. It just didn't work. And now, what is that? It all it was is it didn't work. It's not a big deal. Pastor Gill used to say, when you have a bad church service, we're going to go to Denny's and drink a chocolate shake. We're going to have a milkshake. We're going to party. Any, like, it's okay. We're going we're gonna to move on. But, but there is this place where our identity gets so wrapped up in, 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 in ministry. And what is it? It's a form of, it's a form of arrogance. It's a, it's a form of saving face. It's a, it's a form of that I can't just be real. I can't just process with friends. It's a, it's a form of, and, and here's what the enemy will do. You'll do better next time. You'll get them next time. 
And here's what the enemy does. He comes in order to, to fuel our performance so that we're living for the praise of man. And it's an enemy of humility. That's not honesty. You don't know if what you're really getting is, is, is true. You know, that's GMOs. That's GMP. That's genetically modified preaching. <laughs> you're just doing that to get us to love you. But Pastor Darren, we already stink and love you, so just tell us the truth. Listen, everybody here, you're already stinking love, so just tell the truth. <laughs> just be humble. Why? When you're humble, oh, grace will flow. There's grace. There's grace. Be honest. There's grace for the honest. Be humble. There's grace for the humble. And the last thing is be repentant. Free of unrighteousness. That, that, that what is that what is repentance looks like? It, it looks like this this place of, of of where we're that when the Holy Spirit hovers over our hearts, we're able to discern when something is not right. That's what unrighteousness is. When something is not right, and we simply come into a righteous state of mind, we recognize where we're in error, we make that adjustment within our heart, and we're good to go. That you are righteous because of what Christ Jesus has done for you. Your unrighteous behaviors do not make you unrighteous. So then what does repentance do? Repentance is a posture where it says, I am open to change. I am changing. You are a part of this change. The Holy Spirit is a part of this change. I can handle the sharpening. I can handle the buffer. I want that. I need that. Don't tell me. Listen, please. Don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. Why? Because what God has for me is going to require a sharper Darren. It's going to require a Darren that looks more and more like Jesus, which is why I can promise you this. In this last year, the Lord's been teaching me a lot about what it means to be a father. What do fathers do? They are honest. They're honest with people. I haven't wanted to be honest with people. Why? Because, <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> Like when you're honest with people, that people don't often feel loved. Why? Because you're telling the truth. But isn't that what love is? Love is when you tell the truth. And then you got people, you know, maybe that are leaving the church or whatever because you told them the truth. Why? Because you love them. Because you, and that's what I want. And I know that's what you want. And that's what we want together. Why? Because when there's honesty, there can be repentance of, oh my gosh, I didn't see that. Yeah, because it was in your blind spot. Like, oh my gosh, I didn't see it. That I've been doing the same thing like year after year for like way too ridiculously long. Love me enough to tell me the truth. Like, and if we're just honest for a second, if your last five pastors had the same problem, honey, it wasn't their problem. I just got to get out of Seattle. I just got to get to California. <laughs> That'll fix everything. <laughs> yeah, move to L.A. It's like the promised land. It's absolutely amazing. <laughs> Everywhere you go, there you are. We have to confront the enemy enemy so that we can truly be free. And that is that we are repentant. We have a, 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 a posture of repentance where we want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I will. Christ Jesus is my truth, and he will set me free. Just to clear, I'm going to be honest. Hi, man. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be repentant. I will not be fake. I'm not going to do this whole, like, like uh, 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 American, you know, Christianity kind of thing. Like, oh, my gosh. Some of the stuff that I'm hearing and seeing just... We need people that look like Jesus. We, we need people that have some courage. We need some people that say, hey, he created me with a mouth, so I guess that means I better speak. I guess I better speak up. He created me. He created me for a purpose, for this, this time. That no, that, that, that evolution lied to you. You're not an evolved plasma. You didn't just turn into a gorilla. You're not just, you're just not some sort of Neanderthal. Ugh, dude, ugh. 
Sex. Eh. That's what the world says. And the world's a liar. And the devil is a liar. And he just wants you to go to your job, do your thing, mind your own business, you know, fund your 401k, you know, recycle, wear a mask, like all of these things. Like, like just, just do your thing. Just perform. Nothing wrong with a mask. Nothing wrong with recycling. I try to recycle. I just put the wrong thing in the wrong whatever. Lord, Lord, forgive me. You know, those poor guys at the recycling plant, like you can't throw a propane tank in a recycling bin. So, but there's this place where, I'm just, I wouldn't do, there's this place where, <laughs> where one day we wake up to the brilliance of God and we recognize that we are the fruit of his brilliance. And that if the enemy can trick us into thinking that God doesn't really need us, that, that God doesn't really need us. That God just created us because he was, because he was lusting for more words. God just needs to create a bunch of little things that will tell him how awesome. Listen, that's not why he created us. He did not create us because, because he was deprived in and of himself. And he needed, and he needed like, to be told how awesome. Like, I don't think that God has to be told you know, how awesome he is you know, all, all the time. That in his love, because love creates, Andrew and I, we love each other, right? Covenant and marriage. And all of a sudden, here comes Abigail Love always creates that in the context of covenant love, there is always creation. And here you have a father and a son and the Holy Spirit and all this communion and all this union and all this connection and all this intimacy and all this fire and all this glory. And they couldn't help themselves. They had to create. And the Lord said, let there be light. And what was that? It was the consummation. It was the spark in the womb. And then there was Adam and he breathed into, into Adam. He breathed his spirit, his consciousness, that sense of, oh, ah, and then he, he, and he's like, Adam, he's cool. But let's just admit, dude needs some help. Wasn't eating, wasn't taking baths. So he put Adam to sleep and he took, he, he taught ramen every, every day. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, breakfast. He was going to kill himself. The Lord put him to sleep. He took from his rib he created Eve. We see the very first song, the very first song that was sung. Adam, come, he, 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 comes, he comes alert, he comes awake, and there is Eve, beautiful, amazing, naked Eve. And Adam starts singing, here she is, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Like, he starts singing, and there's song, and there's connection. It's the Father, the Son, the Spirit, intimacy, creation, Adam, Eve, worship, union, sexuality. Yes, 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 worship before the Lord. And there's procreation, and there's life, and this is what God created. This is what he made. And it's beautiful and it's glorious. It's his brilliance that you are the fruit of the brilliance of God and that you and your wife, you reveal a glory, a particular, special, revelatory glory that cannot be revealed in any other marriage, in any other family. That You've got your story. You've got your testimony. You've got your battles. You've got your wounds. You've got your scars. And the enemy doesn't use that to shame you. Oh, he tried. But now your past is a platform to say, look at what the Lord has done. He redeemed me. He restored me. That no matter if you're single, there's grace. If you're married, there's grace. If there's a lack of intimacy, there's grace. That God wants to use you and your storyline. He wants to use even the sad, the broken parts of you to reveal that he is the God that can bring beauty out of ashes. Just say, shame off me. Shame off me. Enemy can't touch you. Shame, shame off me. I was created. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a big, just declare this right now. I'm kind of a big deal. Yeah, look at the person next to you. Say, I, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a big, big deal. If you're married, you can say, yep, you're married to this. Hello. What's up? What's up? You're married. You're married to this. And if you're not married, don't sell yourself short. Don't, don't, don't give yourself to, to a loser. Only, only a winner for you. Only a champion for you. There is grace in this place. You know, not bragging, but, but a lot of people that we've seen married have, have stayed married at Seattle Revival Center. Divorce has not been the majority. It's, it's not that, that, that a very small minority. And I love that. I think that is awesome. And this is what I know, that no matter what you're going through today, no matter what your marriage is going through, your spouse is going through, whatever, there's grace. 
He's got it. There's hope. And you know what this world needs? Hope. This world needs what's in you. Jesus Christ, this hope of glory. Protect your hope. Don't let the world rob you of hope. Don't let religion rob you of hope. There's grace. Let this hope come alive. And let's just see what Jesus wants to do. Is that good? You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. And it doesn't matter. I mean, let me just say this real quick. Some of you, you've you've been having a lot of thoughts from the enemy. You are not your thoughts. Just because you're being tempted by something, that doesn't mean that that is who you are. That's where the demonic comes to get us to believe lies. And I know what I'm talking about. I've believed a lot of lies. I probably believe more lies than anyone anyone here. And this, this is what I know. The thief is a liar. So just because you're being tempted by something, that doesn't mean you, you say, well, I, I'm gay. I was born, so I'm less. I love, there's a, a Betty Johnson. She was getting her hair done. And her hairdresser said, you know, so I'm gay. And, and she goes, no, you're not. It's Bill Johnson's wife. That, that, whoa, and I don't know, but yeah, I've, no, I've never done that. You know, no, you're not. But he goes, I'm gay. She goes, no, you're not. And I don't know what happened from there, but all I know is that she got her hair cut there uh, not, not too long after that. And he said, guess what? What? I realized I wasn't really gay. And then they, they here's the thing. You, you can believe a lot of things about yourself, but sometimes somebody just comes and turn, turns the lights on and everything. I'm just a pervert. No, you're not. I'm just an alcoholic. No, you're not. God did not create, you say, I'm going to create an alcoholic in my image and likeness. That's not, that's, that's an identity statement. That's not who you are. You're a son, you're a daughter of God, and you're wrestling with alcoholism. I'm telling you, a lot of people don't want to talk about sin. A lot of people don't want to, it's not about your behavior. Well, then we can rip out Corinthians out of our Bible because he talks a lot about behavior. We've got to learn to start talking about stuff, wrestling with it. And we've got to learn to get back to this conversation of identity and destiny. And we've got to stop willing, being willing for the enemy to rob us of our identity and our destiny. You're a child of God. You're, I don't even believe in your God. I don't care. He believes in you. Yeah. You're created in the image and likeness of God. I don't care if you like it or not. His goodness and his mercy is going to stalk you. His kindness. God, come and get me. Come and strike me. He's just, I love you. You're my son. The Bible says that his kindness leads us into repentance. What does that mean? It means he loves us and loves us and loves us until our heart begins to change. And it begins to go from stone into flesh. He loves you. God loves you. Your father loves you. Your daddy loves you. He's not ashamed of you. He's not embarrassed of you. He's so proud of you. You reveal his brilliance. You reveal his glory. He loves your marriage. He loves your children. He wants to reveal who he is to the world through you. Well, I was long-winded today, but thanks for hanging out anyways. Why don't you stand? I want to bless you. If our ministry team would come, if you want prayer for anything, um, we'd love, love to pray for you, prophesy over you. Just go ahead and put out your hands in a receiving posture. Father, I pray for grace right now. Grace right now. Grace right now. Grace right now. The oil of grace, Lord. The oil of your kindness right now. Fill every heart here with revelation. If the rest of our ministry team could come, because Anthony can only do so much. All right. All right. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your kindness, Lord, your perseverance. Thank you, Lord, that you're not giving up on anyone here. There's not one person you're like, that's your third strike, you out. No, 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 no. This isn't baseball. This is the kingdom of God. I declare your infinite love, light, and acceptance over each and every person here. I prophesy destiny over you. I prophesy a revelation of your destiny because you've had a revelation of your shameful events, and I just declare the blood of Jesus in this room right now. The blood of Jesus in this atmosphere right now. I pray for the blood of Jesus that would break every yoke, every stronghold. I pray, Lord, that everything that comes to exalt itself over the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, that it be brought down to its knees right now in Jesus' name. I declare Jesus is the Christ, the holy and anointed one, the risen 
the risen son we declare he is the lamb that was slain lord we thank you that this room is pregnant with possibility i thank you that each and every person here is pregnant with destiny and lord i pray that each and every person here would fight for that destiny that they would pr uh, protect that destiny and lord i thank you lord that this is a bait i think i said that right patty you said bait no bait the house bait i said it right that we are a bit tikva there's already a church called bit tikva in newcastle but now there's two we are a house of hope just declare of yourself right now i am a house of hope i am a house of hope i am a house of hope in jesus name everybody said come on everybody said amen god bless you Come get some prayer.